Let me welcome you to the event this afternoon. My name is Helmut Anheim, the Dean here at the Hertie School, and I'm uh, very, very delighted uh, to uh, have this event take place today and also to welcome old friends um, uh, to the school here. Uh, the, the topic is of uh, keen interest uh, to us as um, policy analysts uh, is, is about a question of innovation and where does innovation come from and what is the contribution of different sectors in society, what is the role of government in bringing about uh, social innovations, what is the role of business, what is the role of foundations and civil society institutions. And that agenda has come very much to the forefront in recent years. Uh, you see it by the establishment of uh, uh, social innovation units at various levels of government uh, in the UK, in the US, and uh, there are also social investment uh, approaches that have been taking place. We, we all know, or many of us have studied, various forms of social investments, and behind these social investments is usually the promise of some innovation that would lead to both a social and an economic uh, payoff. So it's a very, very uh, uh, challenging topic, but I think it's also one that can bear immense fruit over the years. So I wish you... Um, Good liberations this afternoon, and I hand it over to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome uh, to this panel session. I would like to extend my gratitude to, for, to the Hertie School for hosting us, similarly to the Stanford Center on F Philanthropy and Civil Society, who has also been our home for this research, and finally the Rockefeller Foundation, who has supported us uh, generously. Uh, throughout this, this journey of doing research on innovation in, the social, sec in social sector organizations. Before we actually dive in into the topic, let me introduce the distinguished uh, panelists uh, that we have here today. And in the usual spirit of uh, panel discussions at the Hertie School, there will be plenty of room for, for questions. It's all about questions uh, in order to actually find uh, answers. So let me just get started and uh, introduce actually Imran, Imran Martin first, who will join us uh, via Skype. He sits in London in his office uh, at Save the Children. He's a uh, director of international development at Save the Children and has before that uh, held several uh, senior leadership positions at BRAC. Most of you know BRAC, uh, the often referred to as the largest NGO in the world operating out of Bangladesh, but at, the, at this point in time really operating also uh, uh, on more continents, if not to say uh, globally. Uh, on my left, uh, Iftikhar Enatuya and actually Maksud Sina, who sits here uh, on the table in the front. Uh, the two of them are uh, founders of Waste Concern. Waste Concern is one of the poster childs of the social entrepreneurship uh, movements. What they have done is turning a, a turn, they really turned a problem into a resource. Problem meaning waste, organic waste. They're both engineers, have developed um, a technology to turn that into organic fertilizer, but the innovation journey didn't stop there. The innovation journey continued, and they uh, have innovatively, creatively made use of what has been become available in terms of carbon credit markets and developed innovative ways of how to harness those. And they're one of the few examples, uh, definitely not the, f uh, the only ones, but uh, the probably some of the most prominent ones that showed how innovation in the global south actually can have impact and inform decision making in the north. They are also not only innovators on the more physical technologies, but also on the social technologies. And here I mean like the way we organize. And uh, some of the most uh, creative um, achievements are in the way how they forge forge partnerships, for example, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United Nations. More on that uh, in our conversation. Uh, following that, uh, we have uh, Alnor Ibrahim. Alnor Ibrahim is a professor at the Harvard Business School. The 
the head and uh, heart of the social enterprise initiative. And as I often say, he, he basically is what we try to be at the Healthy School, uh, some, the ones that actually cross and bridge disciplines. Having have earned a, a PhD in engineering at Stanford University, he got tenure at the School of Pu uh, Public Policy International Affairs, Virginia Tech, and then moved on to the Harvard Business School. Uh, this is at the very end of the panel. This is not Ishtiaq Hussein. Ishtiaq Hussein uh, was supposed to be here, a young professional from Brak in Bangladesh uh, who has never been outside of Bangladesh and this would have been his first time. He was declined the visa two days ago from the German ambassador. But I have the pleasure to introduce Christian Selos uh, on the panel, originally actually a, a natural scientist by training, then converted to what he would refer to as the dark sides, the social sciences, and actually a, a lead researcher in this particular project, where also Joanna Villegala is part of, she's sitting here. Uh, and uh, a scholar at the Stanford um, Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. Let get, let's get started here. Christian, why, why, uh, social in, why innovation? Helmut already referred to uh, what's going on, and it's fair to say that innovation landed securely on the planet of the social sector. Um, social entrepreneurs are the heroic change agents, the, Foundations philanthropists are converting their philanthropic money into social ventures. In Germany, we have the good old social welfare organization not only talking about uh, innovation, but also uh, desperately trying to show that they are innovative. On the development side, we have a development agency such as I just use USAID, for example, or the um, development uh, banks that create uh, innovation centers. Um, is this our hope, our last hope for making progress? Or why do, why do we care about innovation now so much in the social sector, Christian? You know, I, I don't really know why we push innovation so hard. Let me be a little bit pro provocative here. I want to leave you with, with a core message um, that, I, that I really believe in. Unless you can make innovation productive as an organization, don't do it. Um, it it's funny, you know, individually we get to live such long lives, but collectively we, we somehow got so impatient. We want to eliminate poverty in 12 months' time. And in a way, I have the impression that innovation is the thing that we kind of hope will make this happen, kind of a quick fix to our problems. Because old, old traditional recipes uh, are too slow and we are kind of frustrated with lack of progress. So we're kind of putting all of our hope in innovation. The reality is that organizations are not made or are not designed to be innovative. Organizations are designed to create predictable, positive outcomes on a reliable basis. This is what organizations do. They are not designed to be innovative. Entrepreneurs are innovative. They build organizations around an idea, but once you have an organization up and running, most of the value that we create every day around the world comes from companies and organizations exploiting what they have, becoming more productive, becoming more efficient, creating predictable value today. So, so uh, I think a, a, a fruitful way to look at innovation is not as an outcome, kind of these inspiring stories of social entrepreneurs, but as an organizational process that is difficult and it is counter to the design of most organizations. So um, I would actually go as far as to say the nature and context of many poverty-related problems may not always need innovation, but long-term commitment, hard work, changing people's aspirations, changing how people relate to each other, employing social technologies, not just te technical solutions. And maybe there is also a real need to make these improvements, this getting better all the time, sexy again, and not just putting all the sexiness on the innovation side. If you innovate too much, you may not create much value. You may go down as an organization. If you really think you have to innovate because you, for some reason you cannot push what you have further or you cannot make it more productive or there's competition or, or what other reasons. If you have to innovate, you must learn to make it productive by 
looking at the complicated process, which for an organization means allocate resources to uncertain, far away outcomes. That's a difficult thing to do. And if you cannot learn how to make it productive, don't do it. Thank you, Christian. Imran, you, had, um, you held leading positions in, um, or you at the moment hold also leading positions in an organization that's very different from the one that you have been part before. In a way, the two organizations, Save the Children and Brack, are the two faces of we, we uh, would call the coin of uh, international development. BRAC, the, um, the NGO that started out in Bangladesh, uh, starting born in the south, going global, Save the Children, on the other hand, being this uh, internationally active civil society organization uh, operating out of London, trying to have a local impact. What role does innovation play in these, in these two very different types of organization? Could you elaborate a little bit on the differences, similarities, and possibly also uh, challenges uh, for this innovation when it comes down to innovation? Right. And thank you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the term innovation features, uh, you know, extremely uh, uh, in an in a, in a emphasized way in both, this, both these organizations. But I think uh, there are actually uh, uh, some key, key differences uh, in the way uh, it, is, it, is, it is approached. And I think that sort of uh, stems primarily from, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the legacy and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the structure and the global positioning of these, uh, of these uh, you know, two different, uh, uh, you know, organizations. Uh, I mean, for instance, I think uh, uh, BRAC is extremely uh, uh, good in terms of uh, learning and innovating while it is delivering. And I think, I think that is a, a hallmark of, 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 of an organization like, like, uh, like BRAC, and, uh, which, which I think is difficult when you have the kind of a global footprint organization such as, say, the children, which, which is, is trying to uh, look at innovation from a much more, more uh, a kind of a, a you know, structured way. Uh, there is an element of messiness in innovation, which, which, which I think uh, 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 more focused, uh, you know, uh, uh, one country organization such as BRAC is able to uh, deliver on, which is very difficult when it has to be diffused across a global architecture. And I think BRAC faces a very similar challenge of taking that innovative spirit, if you like, as it becomes global, you know, and, and uh, that that is a challenge that Iraq is also facing right, right, right now. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so I think there is that 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 particular difference and challenge in terms of knowledge transfer uh, of innovative practices. Uh, the other two things I just want to highlight here: one is I think the resourcing uh, 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 structure, the realities of resourcing, also needs to be uh, uh, sort of looked at. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 you know how how different uh, you know organizations can support innovation, you know BRAC has got a resourcing structure which allows it gives it a huge amount of flexibility. BRAC's genius is really in its financial uh, resourcing structure, which allows a 80% of its resources to actually have huge amount of flexibility because of its social enterprise focus. Uh, uh, a way of approaching finance. And, and Brack has been always very clear that it needs to do that because it does not come from a, a, a society that can rely on public uh, uh, funding uh, from the common people to basically resource itself. And it has always, always been clear how to take institutional finance and create flexibility. And I think that international NGOs are not very good at in terms of relying on very traditional forms of Unrestricted resources only through, uh, 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 you know, uh, through the pop, you know, private giving that comes from, uh, you know, individuals in the country, 
And I think that that whole balance between restricted and unrestricted resources also drives the extent to which uh, uh, global organizations can actually be actually innovative. And with that comes this whole issue of how do you de-risk innovation, because to de-risk innovation, you do need flexible resources, you do need unrestricted resources, and also how you balance the culture of a, an organization that is compliance driven and a culture that is more innovative. Thank you. This is very helpful because it gives us also the, the ingredients, if you will, for what you have to think about when you develop a specific innovation strategy for a social sector organization. Risk, your attitude towards risk, the resources that you have available uh, in terms of to whom are you accountable, to whom are you, you know, as Imran was mentioning, what is your compliance strategy? Uh, no doubt. There is no single recipe. There is not the one and only innovation strategy that ensures that an organization can innovate on a continuous uh, basis. There is also no doubt, and we just heard that again, that innovation is an investment. And for an investment to pay off, to actually harness the value uh, that an innovation can create in the so for a social sector, that means it has to scale. So there is always uh, the issue in an innovation strategy, what's the right balance between an investment in into an innovation and the scaling? Let me turn to Iftikhar. Iftikhar, your organization is in a way very different from BRAC from the organization that Imran has, has worked with, who is, that is very good in, in scaling, scaling and reaching out uh, immediately. Waste Concern is incredibly good at, with coming up with good ideas over and over. So very good in what Christian and I would call upfront innovation. But what's your take on how do you make sure that the investment in generating these ideas and innovation actually also transfer into scaling and the, the impact that, so that you can actually harness the investment uh, in innovation? Uh, thank you, Johanna. Uh, like for any social enterprise, the main goal is to reach a scale. A scale is, is if you reach a scale, then you have, you have impacts. Now, what we have learned from our operation that social enterprise or, or as a social organization, we can develop models, we can develop new ideas and, and technology, but to scale it up and to have effective uh, impact, we need to work in coordination with several partners. Uh, we need to work with the government, we need to work with uh, several organizations to have, a, have an impact. Now, what we have found that working with, uh, with, uh, with partners, uh, working in partnership with the government or with international organization, there are certain rules. They need to know about the impact of your work and they, they want to know whether the impact is verifiable. That's something very important. We need to look in, they, they, they need to look in, they look always the data, whether the data is verifiable, what are the impacts of the project, those things are very important to, to form partnership. And in case of, of, of waste concern, we have been working in Bangladesh for almost, almost 18 years now. And uh, after working in, in the sector for 10, 15, 10 years, and then our work was finally recognized by the government and we have been able to prove that, uh, prove with numbers that the work we are doing, like if you, if you are producing organic fertilizer, it can have an impact on your, on your food productivity, it can reduce greenhouse gas emission, uh, it, can have, it can create uh, uh, new jobs. Once these data were vetted by third party and it was evaluated, only then we have seen that government came into the scene and forged partnership with us. So in our case, we are scaling by having forging partnership with new actors, it is with the government, it's with the, with the private sector, and also with international agencies. So our experience has been a little bit different than BRAC or with other organizations where the organization itself drives the scaling up. Here, we develop the technology or new ideas, we work in partnership and coordinate, coordinate our activity with government and other actors to reach a scale. 
Thank you, Iftikhar. Anur, from the, the experience that we have generated in the field, uh, one could easily have the impression that we often call everything that is new an innovation. Uh, in the business sector, it's, we have good measures or, let's say, good proxies for what an innovation is when we have a patent, uh, R&D investment, and so on. How do we measure innovation performance? Is that an illusion or is there a way to measure innovation performance? I think it's a question, uh, it helps to begin to distinguish between different types of innovation in order to then be able to get at this question. And I think the work on this is still in the social sector in the very early stages. So if we were to distinguish between two broad kinds of innovation, and, and you described one of them already, upfront innovation, in terms of describing what waste concern um, does. So we can think about the upfront innovation, which is this generation of new ideas um, and experimenting. Uh, the language that's often used in uh, organization theory would be exploration, um, which would require, I think, a very particular kind of approach to performance. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and so you could call this upfront innovation, you could call it radical innovation. Um, a second kind uh, would be much more incremental innovation, right? So relatively well-established categories, radical, or upfront and incremental. Um, whereas you use exploration, experimentation for the first kind, for the second kind, you really are looking for things that are already working and you're trying to improve them or scale them. And so here, it's not so much exploration, it's exploitation, to use language from James March. Um, so then the question of performance measurement in these is, well, what do we think about in terms of performance for the exploratory, radical kinds of innovation as compared to um, the incremental, exploitative ones? In the first kind, and this is, I'm hypothesizing here, in the first kind, um, we're trying, the purpose is to try and find solutions to problems for which we don't yet have adequate solutions. And so we need to be able to experiment and fail and experiment and fail and do this relatively rapidly over and over again as we learn. And so there, if we were to put in place performance measures that are based on actually getting results, we would be discouraged from failure and repeating that cycle. And so that would be the wrong kind of performance approach, I think, to put on that. So there, actually, in terms of your performance, you're looking at experimentation, you're looking at failing. And so you could imagine um, incidence of failure as actually being a valuable performance metric in this kind of innovation. If you're not failing, you're probably actually not trying hard enough or you're not thinking sufficiently outside of the box. Um, we would need to suspend, I think, judgment in terms of what actually works until we've done this. Um, and then you would have to develop you know, some sense of cause-effect relationships. And so then you would develop a testing process where you're trying to say, well, within this limited context that we're looking at, um, can we develop a, a model, a cause-effect relationship that we have some confidence will work? And so there, you're building a theory of change, if you will. Um, and so the performance metrics that I would apply here would be high incidence of failure um, and the development of a theory of change for the innovation or set of innovations uh, that you think is relatively robust. You know, once you've done that, um, then I think you might be able to move on to the more incremental kinds of innovation. And so when Iftikhar with Waste Concern shares these initial experiments with established organizations that might be able to take it to scale, um, or Brack learns, uh, as Imran was saying to us, through the implementation process, now you're actually at the point where you want to see replicable results produced reliably. And so there you need much tougher 
performance metrics that can be monitored regularly that help you improve the efficiency and the quality of what you're doing. We tend very often within the social sector to use this second kind of performance metrics um, regardless of the kind of innovation that we're looking at. And that would seem to me to be a mistake because you wouldn't want to apply that to the first kind of radical innovation, but you would want to apply it to the incremental kinds of innovation where you really want that scaling. It comes back, I think, to the purpose of innovation. The first kind is really about developing new solutions. The second kind is about scaling. And so without the first, you can't get to scale. Without scale, you can't actually have large societal impact. Terrific. Uh, this is, uh, allows us also to conceptually understand this better. Uh, in practice, Iftikhar, uh, we mentioned already your innovation strategy relies on actually doing things in partnership. And I also mentioned one of the the, the eminent partnerships that you have with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and with the United Nations, with UNESCAP. So UNESCAP, not necessarily something that we would consider uh, the most an, an entrepreneurial organization, no? In practice, how difficult, how easy is it to, to get partners aligned, that they have a common understanding about you know, what innovation means, how do we measure uh, it, or in the sense, when do we know that we are successful? Any learnings, any uh, best practices you can share with us on this? Thank you, Johanna. Now, it's, it's difficult. It's not always very easy to work with diverse organizations, like the mandate of UN, if you are working with the UN system, uh, their mandate is a little bit different. They want to see that whether you have, uh, you have uh, achieved the MDG goals which, which they are trying to promote. Like in, case, in our case, whether the project is fulfilling the environmental objectives which are mentioned in the MDG, environment sustainability, improvement of sanitation, uh, private sector participation. Once these things are, are embedded in a project and if, it ca if you can show that uh, the project is creating multiple partnerships, like what they want to promote, if you can show that, that uh, in the project that by having this partnership, we are solving uh, the sanitation problem at the root level, at the city level, or at the, at, at the uh, village level, then they become very interested. And then the criteria for them to evaluate these projects are a little bit different, like, like for UN. Uh, they, they like to see that uh, how much people we have served, whether the project is sustaining over time. Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, in case of uh, the, our first replication outside Bangladesh, uh, we work in a city called Matle uh, in, in Sri Lanka, where uh, the UN first wanted to test our model that whether it works in that city. So, we started the project back in 2006. The model worked. It solved the problem of a particular neighborhood. The neighborhood was facing a problem of waste management. It was not collected. There was problem with landfills. So we developed the idea, which was generated in Bangladesh. It was transferred to an organization in, in Sri Lanka. And we, we helped the organization to implement our approach. So once the model and the funding came from UN for piloting, once the model was proven successful, uh, in, it, we started in 2006. In 2010, uh, uh, we, got, we linked the project uh, with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And there was a third party evaluation done for this project by UN. And they have found that the project has actually solved the waste problem of that neighborhood. And then they wanted to scale up to a city level. So the first initial piloting was done in 2006. After three years, once it was proven uh, with assessment, third party assessment that it really works, the city was convinced. Then waste concern and escape, uh, we approached Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that we need to scale up this thing to a city scale. So after having this initial success over a period of time, then Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to the scene and now this city, after, after the piloting back in 2006, in 2013, the entire city is covered with our approach of waste management. And, and that has been a long process. 
it took almost seven years to reach this stage. And in the whole process, uh, we had to go through, through multiple challenges, like we had to sign agreement with the city government and national government to implement the project. Uh, there has been two levels of evaluation of the impact by third parties that the, this actually works and it saves costs for the city, uh, reduces pollution. The city was convinced that the model we were promoting, it was actually reducing their cost of waste, waste management. So again, I would like to, to highlight one thing here uh, that data becomes very important for any social enterprise to scale up. You need to have a data which can be verified and only then uh, there are possibilities of third party supporting your activity. Without data, uh, verifiable data, it becomes very difficult to scale up. Thank you, Iftikhar, and also for, again, like laying out the way of thinking about uh, resources, not just the resources of one organization, but basically also the partnership, the portfolio of resources coming together. Your point about data actually provides us a nice segue into the next question for Imran. Uh, Imran, Brock has uh, for a long time experimented in a way also with specific structural ar arrangements that enable innovation. And one uh, important structure or, um, if you will, organizational device has been RET, the research division. And you know that division really well because you, you basically were the head of RAD for a long time. So RAD is the research and evaluation division of BRAC basically generating what Iftikhar was referring as the necessary data. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the role of RAD uh, in making innovation more productive, more efficient, and are there any lessons to be shared or recommendations for other organizations. We all know that BRAC is relatively uh, unique in many uh, uh, dimensions, but are there any learnings that you think can be drawn from the experience? Yeah, uh, yeah no, that's, uh, that's right. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very uh, unusual for an NGO to have its own research and evaluation division. And uh, you know, I have uh, often, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming out of Prague, actually, I'm sort of beginning to realize how unique and how critical a function that is, uh, 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 because uh, you know, I mean, Prague had a research and evaluation division back in 1973 when Prague started. And Prague was a small experimental project, uh, very much, I guess, this exploratory radical innovation phase that BRAC was in. I think, you know, it's easy to look at BRAC's scheme today and basically, you know, uh, forget about the sort of, the, 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 the kind of phasing and experimentation phase that BRAC had to go through before we went through scaling. The real scale up of BRAC happened in you know, the mid 80s. So, you know, throughout that whole period, it was primarily in three key locations in Bangladesh doing experimentation. And, uh, and, 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 and research and evaluation innovation played a very, very critical role in that. Now, in terms of, you know, you know how, you know, what are the sort of wider implications for other organizations? I think there's sort of a couple. One is, you know, this, this, this whole idea that, uh, uh, you know, research is sort of something that uh, sits outside practice and uh, needs a lot of challenging. I think research is very much a part of practice. Uh, and, and it definitely needs to, there has to be in-house capability to, uh, to, 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 to be able to uh, do, that, uh, 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 do that function. I mean, yes, you can have collaborations with sort of others, but that collaboration cannot happen unless there is an in-house core. And without an in-house core, that collaboration just becomes contract management, and that is not particularly useful. So, you know, many INGOs have what they call ME function is primarily contracting our consultants to basically do third party evaluation. I don't think that really is particularly useful in terms of advancing learning and innovation within, within the organization. So I think that realized very early on that you need this in-house research evaluation. 
Yes, there is a role for third party evaluation and all that, of course, there's a big role for that. But I think there is no substitute for in house operational research to continually look at different uh, no do gap and how to address that no do gap to sort of ensure that we are sort of continually improving. So, you know, as we move from the exploratory radical phase to what is what I've been referred to as the sort of exploitative incremental phase. I think there is a, and then bring back again to the exploratory medical field, I think there is a critical function that the operations research will have to basically play. And, and I think NGOs generally, INGOs, INGOs in particular, uh, are not terribly good at, at investing in, in this whole critical, critical function. Uh, especially if there, I mean, I, INGOs are particularly poor at investing in that critical function at the delivery level. So yes, I, international NGOs would have uh, some analytical capacity at the headquarter level, if you like, but would not really have that at the country level, at the delivery end, where I think a lot of this learning actually happens. So international NGOs are not very, very good in terms of decentralizing innovation in that sense, devolutionizing innovation. Uh, you know, it's still a very centralized model of knowledge and looking at the countries primarily as delivery arms and, and not really focusing on countries as a knowledge platform and as an innovation platform. So, so I think that, that is sort of the other uh, challenge I think for international NGOs and that they should be thinking about how to decentralize and devolutionize uh, in, uh, you know, research, evaluation, more around delivery, where delivery is actually happening. Thank you for this, because it, has, uh, it is an important um, statement, because it's also important for us at the Healthy School, where we actually would have the possibility to develop a generation of professionals who could actually do this. Uh, it's then just about uh, creating the, the understanding that um, this is needed in international organization, but definitely also uh, something for us to think about it at the Herti School in our role of educating uh, the next generation of professionals in such uh, organizations. Uh, Christian, can I come back to you? You're just back from, from India where you uh, did uh, organize a workshop on innovation with Aravind, the largest eye hospital in the world. How do you as a researcher interact and work with organization on issues like ensuring uh, capacity for continuous innovation? So that was a scary thing. You need to imagine, you know, I was in the room for two days with uh, 40 of the most productive eye doctors in the world. Collectively, they could have given light through eye surgeries to about 2,000 patients that weekend, or they could come to my workshop. That's the level of expectation they had. So. Um, Already they are considered one of the most innovative organizations in the world, so, but, but they asked for help to put them on an innovation, on a productive innovation journey. I think what, so I'll be very, very quick. We only have a few minutes and we need to open it up. But I think a major mistake that I see again and again is if uh, facilitators um, help organizations to jump into uh, in innovation immediately. They do an innovation and the idea generation workshop and take it from there. I think that creates two pathologies that are really dangerous. One, it sends the wrong signal. It's the signal that innovation is easy and you can just do it. That's a, a big mistake, I think. And the second thing is, I hear again and again from managers and organizations that, you know, we've built up this idea box uh, some time ago, but no idea was being put forward, or we've allocated these resources, but no one brought an idea. And the, the pathology here is that manager then blames the employees, we just have the wrong employees. They are not innovative. We have everything done that we could. That's very dangerous. What we do instead, or what I do instead, is turn it around. I make very early the organization focus on pathologies, the things that make innovation difficult for everyone in that organization. That has four major positive effects in a counterintuitive way. One is, it, people feel this is liberating. Employees say, oh, this is wonderful. When, when there is an open sharing of the barriers to innovation organization, people say, oh, I'm not the only one who perceives that this is difficult here. It's, it, many people tell me afterwards, this, this is really liberating. They feel like more of a community of people who are struggling to become innovative. The second thing, it's empowering. It empowers the employees to push back to management and say, 
stop making it difficult for us to innovate. You know, put, put, some, put some transparent processes in place. Stop measuring us on predictable outcomes every day and expecting novel experimentation at the same time. It's ridiculous, it doesn't happen. Third outcome is it scales down hierarchies. Uh, all of a sudden, particularly when you facilitate it well and you have a Stanford professor in the room, management does not dare to kind of blame, you know, blame their employees all the time. But there's, for the first time, an open discussion and a recognition that we really need to empower the people and, and scale down our, our hierarchies, provide more time for employees. And, and the, fourth, the fourth outcome is really it creates an attitude of productive dissatisfaction, which is the essential part of building a culture of innovation. By focusing on the negative in a, in a productive way, people will come up with all kinds of ideas of how do we structure ourselves internally better to make innovation happen. And it's this attitude that is required for innovation to take place. Then, of course, you need a, a senior champion. If you don't get a senior champion to push this forward and protect the innovating team and protect their resources, against uh, the immune system of the regular organization, it goes nowhere. And then you take it from there. But as, as Alnor also said, you, st you see this as a journey. You, know? you start slow. You need to build momentum, pick the low-hanging fruit, build confidence, and you know, tw you know, uh, play around with finding the right structures and processes, changing some of your, of your values uh, along the way, and, and really take it from there. Thank you.